are our latest steps, and they will not be our last steps. This will continue to be my top priority 24-7. That was Governor Doug Ducey declaring a public health emergency in Arizona on March 11, 2020. On that day, there were just nine cases of the coronavirus in a state of seven million people. Just nine cases. The first COVID-19 death wouldn't be reported for another week. Two years later, two million COVID cases have been reported. Almost 30,000 of our fellow Arizonans are dead. And according to the Centers for Disease Control, Arizona has the second highest COVID death rate in the country. Throughout this pandemic, we've relied on the advice and insight of former Arizona Public Health Director Will Humble. He's now Executive Director of the Arizona Public Health Association. He joins us once again for a look at what we learned and whether we're prepared for the next time. Will, great to see you again. Thanks, Brown. The governor says the public health emergency is over. I think the public believes it is. Is it over? Well, I, I don't disagree with him. Um, you know, the purpose of a public health emergency is to give a governor or a president more authority than they normally have. So that's the purpose for a public health emergency. And so I agree that it was time to end the Arizona public health emergency because he wasn't using that authority for anything productive. Um, it was more in the last 12 months. It's been more harm than good that he's been using that authority for. So I'm totally on board with ending that emergency authority at the state level. Now, reading off those COVID numbers, I was at that news conference on March 11, 2020, and things seemed quite grave then. And to look back and see there were just a handful of cases at that time it is yeah. stunning. And now where we are today, talk about what happened, what decisions were made along the way that got us to the point of having the second yeah. highest death rate in the country. So the way I look at it, there were three critical control points. One was the way we ended the stay-at-home order in May of 2020, which set us up for that hospital crisis. We were in crisis standards of care in July of 2020. So that was our first big death wave as a result of the way we, not when, but the way we moved out of that stay-at-home order with a purely voluntary system without any enforcement in June. The second was not any enforcement of CDC mitigation measures in December and January of 2020, 2021. Um, and that was our second huge uh, death spike. That was, you could call that the alpha wave. And then the third thing was the failure to use policy to drive up vaccination rates in the, the spring and the summer of 2021, which because we didn't require uh, vaccination cards for bars, restaurants, nightclubs, museums, stuff that's fun, we didn't get adequate vaccination rates, which led us to the reason why we had such a big Delta death wave. Was the response, was the governor's response too political, too overtly political? Well, I believe it was. I mean, it just look at just look at it empirically. Look at, take for example, the, the way we moved out of that stay-at-home order in May of 2020. It was, the, he, announced, he had an executive order at the end of April extending that stay-at-home order. And when pr former President Trump announced he was going to go to Motorola for that mask factory event... He changed the executive order, and two days later, based on data that was no, there was no new data. And it, and and, and it, it, to me, I mean, who can say for sure, it, you know, what's in his head? But it was just obvious to me that that was political. Yeah, I was, I was there through all of that, and it, the turnabout was just stunning. Yeah, and the data was not accurate. Correct. Uh, to put it kindly. So you've been in public health for 40 years. You have the advantage of that. This was a once-in-a-century event. You had the advantage, I suppose, also of preparing for it in a way perhaps uh, the governor did it. Um, you've been critical of the governor. I wonder what you think you may have misjudged or got wrong in your own response. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, early on, I was actually, you can go look at an old blog of mine in March or April of 2020 where I was saying, where is the evidence that masks, masks are an intervention? Because there wasn't any evidence. It was, people were saying that you should wear a mask, but I'm like, let's, where's the evidence for that? Not saying you shouldn't wear a mask, but I was looking for the evidence. And in hindsight, it should have been intuitive to me that this was an airborne virus and that, of course, even in the absence of data, masks would be valuable. So there were times when I should have anticipated what would be an effective intervention before even having the data, I think. 
But wasn't this one of the lessons for all of us, if people were able to learn it, was, yes, public health experts might say this in March, and they're saying this yeah. in August, and it's different, but we learn as we go along. Right. That's the nature of science. Like, science is an iterative process. It builds on itself. You form a hypothesis, you test it, you see what happens, then you use that information to move forward and test something new. And so, I, you know, many people's brains don't work in an iterative way, they just wanna know. But science moves, and with that movement comes changing recommendations, and that is one of the things that we saw over the last two years. And as you said, it's a hard adjustment for a lot of people. So, let's look ahead. Uh, how well prepared are we for the next pandemic, and it might be another version of coronavirus? Well, I think we've, I mean, we've learned a lot globally. If you look at the body of literature around uh, how to slow down um, a, a virus like this, internationally, there's a lot of new evidence. Where we need to go now, I think, is to look at the differences between states and countries and the way they approach this pandemic and the policy initiatives that they implemented so that we can build the evidence base for the next pandemic so that we are in a better position. Quite honestly, at the beginning of this, we were actually looking at data from the, the 1917 flu pandemic. That was like, we were looking at journal articles from 100 years ago. And now we have the ability to do a lot of analysis, international, analysis internationally to figure out like what worked, and we're all rushing to read. And what didn't work? We're all rushing to read books about the uh, nineteen uh, yeah, yeah. seventeen flu pandemic. You've talked about how uh, right now you think Mark Brnovich is playing a valuable role in challenging the CDC on its rules. Tell us about. Yeah, that. I just put up a blog about that. So uh, uh, Attorney General Brnovich joined twenty-one other states to challenge the CDC's regulations on transportation. Basically, most people will see it as the mask requirement on jets, and. The reason it's important to challenge that CDC rule is because we gotta know in advance of the next pandemic what CDC's existing authority actually is according to the courts. So that if, it, if CDC never did have the authority to require masks on jets, then we need to know that so Congress can fix that act and give them that additional authority. So it is important to challenge things in court so you know what the courts think so you can fix it for next time. It's a lot like science. Uh, I do want to end with uh, an alert for m many viewers. Here in Arizona, uh, up to half a million adults and children could be disenrolled from Medicaid if they don't check their eligibility, and that has to do with certain things that were done during the pandemic. Yeah. Explain uh, what happened and what they need to do. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So the federal public health emergency says that Medicaid agencies, in our case Access, can't disenroll people during the federal public health emergency. But once that ends, which is probably gonna be early summer, then Medicaid agencies are supposed to redetermine people's eligibility. And there's a lot of people that moved in the last two years in Arizona to a new address, and Access is gonna be sending their like the redetermination notice, like what are you making the income eligibility pieces, and if they don't respond quickly, they could lose Medicaid eligibility. So the take home message is, if you're a Medicaid member, make sure that you go to the agency website and update your address so that when that redetermination period begins, the, the note's coming to the right address. Up to half a million people. Right. Well, humble, great insight as always. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, take care, thanks.